everyone. My name is Caitlin Mary. I am a rising senior at New Mexico State University. And this summer I had the privilege of working with Michael West Ortiz in the Claire Castile lab. Um, and so my question I was investigating was viruses and their vectors. What happens when we expose um, P intonation mosaic virus and beam yellow mosaic virus to erythosome pisum, or otherwise known as the P aphid, which is what I'll refer to it from now on as. Uh, so what is so important about plant viruses? Well, they are a huge, they cause huge economic losses and food insecurity. Also, we as humans have been changing the landscape, which has rapidly evolved our surroundings and viruses have answered in response rapidly evolving as well. So two viruses of interest are bean yellow mosaic virus and P intonation mosaic virus or BYMV and PMV. And they show very similar symptoms. So you see these yellow dots, they're kind of, they're faintly see seeable. Um, those are the mosaics. And then on the PMV, there's also those mosaics, but then there's these dark areas, which are the intonations. So these viruses are very powerful on their own, but they have one fatal flaw, and that is that they require a vector, in this case, aphids. So aphids are a very common agricultural pest. I'm sure most of us have had them in our house plants, but they also affect huge fields as well. Um, so controlling these vectors can help us control the viruses and profoundly reduce the dissemination. Um, aphids also have the capacity to, vi to vector more than one virus at a time, which is why in our study we're looking at two separate viruses. Um, aphids also harbor an endosymbiont called Buchanera aphidicola. Um, it's very important for their influencing their dispersion uh, and fecundity, which is the fertility basically of an aphid. Um, or their ability to reduce is also important when we think about their dissemination. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, the Buchanera aphidicola. So it is an obligate endosymbiont. That means that it has to coexist with the aphid and the aphid relies on it for synthesizing essential amino acids and nutrients. Um, it's in this specialized organelle, it's called a bacterium, and then those are composed of bacteriocytes and there's hundreds of these little buc Buchanera cells inside each bacteriocyte. So from this, um, from this uh, Buchanera, we also get the protein GROEL, which has been shown to be expressed in the aphids honeydew and their saliva as they are feeding on the plants. So GROEL is a very important uh, protein. It's a conserved bacteria chaperone, which means it folds. Um, the GROEL has been found to trigger the plant's pattern triggered immunity, which lowers the aphid fecundity. So in this, this is from a paper where they were checking that GROEL was actually the sun signaling it. This is on uh, Rabidopsis and green peach aphids. So we, compared to the two buffer controls, the plants with the GROEL had reduced a significant reduction in the amount of NIMS um, that were produced. So we wanted to know, Obviously we're using a different virus and we're using a different aphid. Can these translate into the aphid si system? Also, how might Buchanera, Titer, and GROEL expression change? Um, in some previous literature, we've also seen that the viruses such as the potato leaf roll virus have effects on the potato aphid where they were reducing the Buchanera titer and then by context, reducing the GROEL expression. So also we wanna know how does this affect transmission because that's a huge part of uh, our, our agricultural instability with these. So it led to the hypothesis that the co-infection of PMV and BYMV increases transmission by lowering the B. aphidicola titer and therefore the induction of plant-triggered immunity by GROEL. So we had four goals here. One, we need to measure the B. aphidicola titer. Then we need to measure the GROEL expression. We also want to know, can they transmit it? And then lastly, we want to know the fecundity. Um, so we're going to start first with our experimental plan, and I'm going to break it down for you guys. So first thing first is inoculating the Pisum stavium, which is our model plant. So we do this in two ways. One is with the agro infiltration of BYMV. So we use a bacteria called Agrobacterium tumefactans, and we use infectious clones of BYMV. And we literally put the syringe up to it with a little hole, and it goes into the leaf. Um, and we're infiltrating the second set of leaves on these plants because on the first set, we are using rub inoculation for PMV. So you use a um, chemical called carburidium, which is basically a very fine powder. And you literally rub the transcripts that are in a little bit of water with the carburidium. And so it gets into the first true leaves. 
Um, these are then allowed to develop for 14 days um, until they are symptomatic. Um, we, our treatments end up being a control where we have a double mock, which is just the buffer for the agro, and then water with carburidium. And then we have the single treatments of BYMV and PMV, and then our co-infection. Um, one important thing to note is that after these 14 days, we were able to see uh, symptoms in those with PMV, but not with BYMV. Um, so we were unable to confirm infection because our primers were not quite working. Uh, but we assume for co-infection that they at least have PMV and possibly BYMV. So the next thing we have to do is sync the NIMPs. Sinking is incredibly important because unless you have a microscope out there, you can't tell how old an aphid is. So if we were taking them from the colony, we would get inconsistent ages. So what we do is we place five adult aphids into these little plastic cages, um, and we use the first fully expanded leaflet, and we allow them to sit there for 24 hours until they are have produced a bunch of nymphs, and then we left 12 nymphs on and removed and added as needed. Um, and then we left those nymphs inside the clip cages for an additional seven days. So there, from there, we finally have all that we need to actually perform our analysis. So first thing we do is fecundity. So fecundity starts by leaving one adult aphid on the experimental plant, and then you give them 72 hours to produce as many nymphs as they can, and then we remove the adult aphid and count the nymphs by hand. So we saw that the aphids feeding on PMV plants had the lowest number of nymphs, and those on the co-infected plants had the highest number. And so those, these two were significantly different from one another. Um, this insinuates that there may be a mechanism behind co-infection that increases aphids' survival and fitness. The next thing we did was we looked at the transmission. So PMV can be transmitted by apism. That's how it happens in the field. But the way we were monitoring it in our lab was we used one adult aphid and transferred it to a new eight day old plant in those clip cages once again. Um, and then we allowed that to develop for six days and then we removed it and any nymphs it had. And then we allowed the plants to just grow on their own for the next 14 to 21 days where we were checking for symptoms. And as of Monday, which is 17 days post aphid introduction, we saw that one out of 12 of our PMV reps were symptomatic and one out of 10 of our co-infection were symptomatic. Um, this is mean symptomatic with the mosaics. Uh, unfortunately, these values are not quite statistic, statistically um, significant. However, we are gonna continue to watch them for symptoms and hopefully these numbers will go up. So the next thing we did was we lurked, worked on the uh, grow EL expression. So the reason we need RNA is for this grow EL extraction. Um, so the first thing you have to do is you extract the RNA, then you synthesize cDNA, and then you test your primers. And then finally, you get to the good part where you get to do a, piece, a qPCR for the grow EL concentration. Unfortunately for us, we, had, we ran into a quite a few difficulties. So in these red circles, there's supposed to be um, a band. And unfortunately we had just streaks. Uh, we troubleshooted it, uh, could have been temperature extraction method quantity, and we got a little bit better results. Um, so we can see that there at least is some sort of band here. Um, but there's still a lot of streaking. So we need to repeat it before we do any more cDNA synthesis. So our final thing we looked at was the DNA for the B. aphidocola titer. So we need to have both DNA and RNA because we are comparing the grow EL concentrations and the aphidocola titer. Because if you just increase the aphidocola titer, then grow EL might increase in ratio to that, but could be the other way around. So, so very similar to the RNA, extract the DNA, test the primers, and um, then run a qPCR. So the primers we are using are ATPE and EF1 alpha. These are housekeeping genes in the uh, aphid. And we initially did not have a lot of success with these primers, um, but currently we have one primer working for each gene, and we're going to continue to test them and begin extracting the DNA um, on our aphids. So conclusions from this is that we saw that PMV negatively impacts fecundity, um, and aphids reared on these co-infected plants had the highest fecundity. Uh, P aphids can transmit PMV and possibly bean yellow mosaic virus in our future directions 
we really hope to get the primers working for the bean yellow mosaic virus so we can test and that infection to make sure it was there. Um, so we're going to continue our RNA and DNA extractions and uh, analysis, as well as observe the transmission of the plants um, and identify primers for infection. This research is important because it is the first step in understanding the mechanism by which these aphids are so vigorously being able to transmit viruses and can hopefully re lead to better pest integrated management. All right, and thank you so much to the Castile Lab, specifically Michael for putting up with me for 10 weeks. Um, it's been a wonderful experience and thank you to my Mark group back home for facilitating my funding and BTI and Cornell for hosting this. Thanks.